Well, uh, thank you for that introduction, I, I think, George. <laughs> Perhaps I'll answer your question, why do we do it? It's a simple answer. A good politician does not need to know everything. They need to know where the people are that do know everything. And that's why I'm here, because the Oswater brings together some of the best brains in the nation in relation to water. It gives us an opportunity, and thank you to AWA, for what you do to actually make this opportunity available to people to talk about the technical issues, the innovative solutions, but also to talk very much about the strategies and the policies that we need to do to keep water on the agenda, particularly at the federal level at the moment. Today I'm going to talk to you about the next steps in the water reform agenda. But I think before we do that, it's critically important that we understand and reflect upon where we've been and just how far we have come. Often that gets forgotten in the quest to actually deal with the next problem. But the most important part of this reflection, I think, is also to understand what the drivers were for change. So we can look to invest our time and effort on the drivers for the next round of reform and change. So what we've had in Australia is many, many decades of providing water through major infrastructure, building big dams, providing water security in times of, of drought and flood. We've used our groundwater systems and we've used our surface water systems. And we've put in place centralised systems to manage supply of water across, across the nation. Water utilities were mostly government owned. Um, they operated as government departments. There was no delineation between policy, regulation and the provision of services. Pricing was based on political judgment, not business judgment. We had ageing infrastructure, we had institutional fragmentation, we had inefficient regulation and price distortions were, were inhibiting the productivity in the water sector. So this drove the national agenda in water reform back in 1994. And it was also led by the fact that we had growing cities and, pro and significant pressure on our, on our traditional supplies. In places like Perth, we were actually seeing significant climate impacts as well that were causing dams just not to fill anymore. Urban growth pressures also led to, to competing interests and the tensions between those competing interests um, becoming front page news. And the government recognised that there would be significant productivity gains to be achieved through reform in the water sector. But it was not just the water sector they were focused on in those days. It was the, the COAG agenda of 1994 that was led by the, the, um, the competition policy agenda, which is across government in all areas, not just in water. But what it led to for us was the 1994 COAG reform framework, which was signed off by all premiers and uh, the prime minister in uh, 1994. And it was an agenda of microeconomic reforms. And as I said, it was led by the competition policy agenda. It was looking at having us really face the tough issues of water pricing based on full cost recovery, separation of water policy and water service businesses, separation of water property rights from land title, establishment of tradable water entitlements and seasonal allocations, water trading including across borders, and catchment water management planning um, that needed to be addressed and needed to be looked at seriously. The government put in place with this um, a significant negative incentive process called competition payments, where states had to demonstrate that they were making progress against the reform agenda or they would be penalised with uh, um, cuts in, in funding from the federal government. So it was a big incentive and it was the bribery that Kerry Schott was talking about yesterday that drove the agenda. Not because it was a good idea for the states to do it, they would quite happily have continued along the way that they were going. The national agenda though had the interest of, of the nation and that uh, unleashing that productivity within our states um, that was tied up in a whole range of anti-competitive legislation. So those micro Oh, in economic reforms chugged along through that first decade of reform from 1994 to 2004 and we made significant gains. Most states corporatised their water entities, um, moving towards um, upper bound pricing. We separated water and property rights, so we, we began that journey. Um, we established water trade. Water trade has been extremely successful. So in that first decade, we made significant reforms. 
And as the po competition policy drew to a close and that agenda drew to a close, it was decided at the federal level that there was still a need for further reform in the water area. Things like health and water quality um, became important. Um, they were always important, but they became more important so that we could get more consistent regulation across the state and things like the Australian water, drinking water guidelines um, became very important. There was a lot of research in water quality also that was very important. These came along, as long, along with other policy reforms that were driven by other agendas, other drivers such as uh, coastal water care, coastal water reforms that, uh, that actually had impacts on the water utilities as to what level of discharge they could put out into our coastal and, and other environments. And so we had another policy agenda driving a range of the reforms as well. Those policy reforms in the area of coastal reform, for example, in South Australia, created an environment where um, the water utility, SA Water, had to look at other ways to actually treat the water before they put it out into the sea, or instead of putting it out in the sea, if they were treating it to that extent, why couldn't they find other uses for it? So it drove the agenda of recycling and the uses of water in the north and the south of the city for agricultural purposes. But it also drove the, the research into aquifer recharge and recovery processes, which, which are certainly leading in, in that regard. Um, in McLaren Vale, they make extraordinarily good wine. They strain the water through grapes. It's a wonderful way of making Mother Nature use its processes to actually ensure that we turn our wastewater into good product. So after the first decade, we then came to 2004. And it was important at the federal level to maintain this momentum for change because the journey had just begun and water reform is not, does not have an end point. It is a continuous journey towards improvement. And that's what um, is ex so exciting about the water agenda. So back in 2004, the Prime Minister again and all the Premiers agreed to a set of principles called the National Water Initiative, which built on the reforms of the 1994 agenda. But it actually expanded the agenda to include the optimisation of economic, social and environmental outcomes and to include urban and rural water. It looked at, at, at continuing the journey with access entitlements, but to actually build on that with much, much better planning. To look at this, best, this idea of best practice water pricing, I don't think we've got that quite right yet, but we are continuing along that journey. Water markets and trading were again the focus, and as we expanded across the nation water trading opportunities, uh, we actually unleashed an enormous amount of productivity. Integrating water management with environmental management became the buzzword back in the early 2000s. And it was something that has now built into our planning processes a sense of understanding of the three components of, econo of the economy, the environment and the social aspects of water into our planning processes. It's well embedded now in the thinking of our government departments in most states in our legislation. There's a couple of states that are still working on it, but they are still working towards it. And this, is, this has been a really important reform agenda and it is long lasting because it's legislated and it's embedded in the thinking of not only government agencies but of the community. And the community would find it very difficult to go backwards now from that process because they see the benefits of the productivity that water entitlements, that property rights have given to them and the way in which it has provided for them greater flexibility to manage their assets. So the community now have come along with these principles that uh, were supported through the National Water Initiative and I think that we can see those reforms well and truly embedded within the way we think about water broadly speaking. The urban water reform agenda however in the 2004 National Water Initiative was underdone and the reason why it was underdone was because there couldn't couldn't at that stage get agreement on what the burning platform was first and foremost, but secondly, how to go about it. In our 2011 assessment, uh, the National Water Commission undertakes regular assessments of progress towards the achieving the goals and outcomes of the National Water Initiative. We said that there was still a lot of work that needed to be done in the urban agenda. We're going through our 2014 um, review at the moment and that is still firmly on the agenda. We have not got the reform agenda for urban water firmly on the national level in the way that it should be at this point in time. Other things that we did get right was we started to really build strong knowledge and build capacity within our communities and within, within the water sector. Um, we certainly have a way to go with our skills, particularly in rural and regional areas, but that journey is continuing. 
The other thing I think we've done particularly well is to, to engage with the community in relation to the importance of water. Not the understanding, George, of the technicalities of water and the complexities that go with actually making decisions on water, but actually understanding the value of water in our society. The drought certainly helped that. The millennium drought was one of those moments in time that politicians cannot afford to miss. You cannot allow a good crisis to go by without introducing as many of the reforms you've been working on as quickly as possible, because the moment in time will be gone. And then you'll be wondering why you didn't get the reforms up. The crisis of the millennium drought led to enormous changes and accelerated the reform process in, in Australia dramatically. It was led by the Murray-Darling Basin issues. Existing sources were failing and supply was failing into our major cities, so drought came to the city well and truly. The existing model, for example, in the Murray-Darling Basin um, no longer provided um, a, a, a fair and equitable way to distribute water amongst the, the stakeholders and the needs in particular of critical human needs. And it, the rules that we had to share water in the Murray-Darling Basin no longer provided for um, the, the stakeholders in particular critical human needs. The competing demands were fierce and we could no longer sit back and say, it's all right, we're having a meeting about it in November. We needed to address it quickly and we needed to address it with the knowledge that we had available to us at the time. We had finite supplies, we had level five water restrictions in most capital cities. People became very aware of water and the importance of water. People were screaming for the government to do something and were the catch cry, why hadn't they planned for this? Why isn't the infrastructure here now when we need it? Was the catch cry we were hearing from every corner of the nation. So decisions were made to build desalination plants, decisions were made to build pipelines, decisions were made to introduce recycling, decisions were made to actually try and secure the nation's water supply. In my view, most of these were very good decisions in the, base, in the time frames and the circumstances under which they were made. There's a lot of assessment of those decisions, in hindsight, knowing the date it actually rained. But when you actually assess those decisions from the basis of where you were in the decision-making process and the fact that you did not know when it was going to rain, you have to think of those questions and those, those assessments of the decisions in the light of the reality of the decision-making. What we have seen over that period of time, though, is a legacy of water investment unlike no other decade in the history of the nation. That will stand us in good stead when the next drought comes along, and when those communities cry foul that the governments have not prepared, we'll be switching on desalination plants around the nation, and water will be coming out of taps, and there will be significant less impact on those people outside the cities who are um, who require access to that water as well because there'll be alternative supplies for our cities. Recycling, now that's a really interesting one. People, and there's been a lot of talk about recycling during the course of this, of this um, conference. And uh, potable reuse, should we be going down the path of potable reuse? Well, it's certainly something that uh, the last decade of research and debate and um, discussion about water issues that has f f firmly put recycling on the agenda. Um, when we think about recycling for potable reuse, often we refer to the Toowoomba instance, um, where, where there was a, a battle like no other about whether or not we should have um, potable reuse water. But what were the drivers of that particular debate? Were they about the use of recycled water, or were they about who was going to be mayor? I think we'll just leave that one for now. What we also saw over the last 10 years is significant emphasis on in putting in place proper measurement of our water resources and proper understanding of what we use. You cannot manage something properly unless you monitor it, m measure it and monitor it. And the investment over the last decade in particular in the area of water meters and monitoring of our water system has been substantial. We actually know very, very well how much water we knew, use. We know how we compare with the rest of the world in relation to our leakage rates and our, our losses in the system. And we compare very, very well, in fact, we're world leaders. 
in meeting our, our water quality standards, the recent national performance reports that were released by the National Water Commission identified that out of 81 utilities across Australia that we looked at, 78 of them met their water quality requirements 100% of the time. Where else in the world does that happen? We've also seen significant effort put into long-term planning. And by that, we've got Water for the Future in the ACT, we've got Queensland's discussion papers out in that regard. Water for Good in Australia, in South Australia, is looking to, is a, a plan for, for water security to 2050. And there's the document Melbourne's Water Future, and there are many others. The last decade has put long-term planning and better planning, in particular for infrastructure replacement and augmentation as, as our cities grow firmly on the agenda. As I said before, the value of water in the minds of our community has grown. We understand a little bit more about the water cycle, but here's something that I think we need to work harder at. And George, you've actually pointed this out to us very, very clearly over the last three days, that the industry is very good at patting itself on the back. But telling our story beyond our own little circle is a difficult one to do. It's not a particularly sexy news item to talk about drains or microsporidium, whatever we were talking about last night. It doesn't grab the attention of the 30 second media grab. So we have to find other ways to raise the awareness of the importance of water in the education of our communities. And education is an interesting word because education comes from people who want to learn. They are educated when they want to learn. When you have a community that most often has their ears completely switched off to things like the issues of water quality because it just comes out the tap when they turn it, your messages have to be a lot more subtle. They have to be a conditioning of the message so that people take not only take for granted that the water comes out the tap, but they, they don't take for granted that there is a whole series of processes that happen behind it. And we're not very good at doing that yet. We need some more work in that area. But how did our communities respond to the drought? They responded extraordinarily well. The bounce back once the drought was over and it rained in the, in the use of water didn't occur to the extent that people thought it would. Behavioural change had occurred over that period of time. So in that 10 years, we did get some of our messaging right and our water-wise messaging has lingered in the community and is now embedded in the thinking of, of the majority of, of our communities. And as a consequence of that, we have a challenge in the water industry because when you sell less, but you still have the same amount of infrastructure to maintain, you need to actually raise the prices. So people are using less and paying more and they don't understand why that is the case. We need to be better with our messaging on that as well. Right, so 2014 and beyond, well, what are the next challenges to build on for after 1994 and, and 2004? We've got two decades of very, very good, solid project, uh, progress. We are seen as world leaders in the area of policy reform. We lead by a long way. It doesn't mean we need to rest on our laurels. There is still the journey to embed and continue the progress that we've made from 2004 and, and 1994, but there are some significant questions and they have been raised during the course of this conference. And, and I'd like to congratulate AWA again for, for their effort in actually not only providing a conference where the technical aspects of water can be fully explored and understood and, and innovations shared, but the strategic discussions and the policy areas that have been talked about through the course of this, this um, conference are critically important and I congratulate AWA for, for providing an environment for us all to have those discussions. What we need now is the strategy that's going to take it forward and to create an environment where government understands that water is critical to the environment, where it's been managed really well in the reform agenda for the last decade, but it is also critically important for the economy. We need to have that solid long-term planning that includes all options for future augmentation. We can't politically rule out one. We need to keep on the table the recycling. We need to keep on the table desalination. We need to keep on the table the stormwater reuse and closing the water cycle. We need to ensure that from a political perspective that the water industry is not inhibited in its innovation by political niceties that come up and, and, and go during election cycles. We do need nationally consistent independent regulation. We have independent regulation in most states now, 
But is that inter independent regulation truly independent? Is it actually providing what we need for the future investment in our water infrastructure? The answer to that question is quite simply no. There is still significant political interference in the decisions around water pricing and water businesses. Water businesses should not have to go to the government and say to them, can we please build this wastewater treatment plant? They should be able to make those decisions on, is this the right business decision? and they should be able to price that right business decision into their pricing policies. How you get nationally consistent independent regulation is a tricky question because there is no lead agency at the federal level in that area. Water, from an urban perspective, is firmly embedded in, in the responsibility of the states. And so it is the industry that's going to have to drive the agenda to support state governments in coming to the conclusion that they will have greater um, productivity and better water utility management if they can have better independent regulation. From the perspective of the push to develop the north, we need to ensure that we build the NWI principles that have worked so well for us into the future decision making and not allow water to be seen as, as a constraint but as an enabler in those decisions. And if we do it well, we can avoid the mistakes of the past. So we can use the lessons of the past to ensure that we keep those NWI, those National Water Initiative principles that are the blueprint that have worked so well for us in the past into the decisions of the future. That way we get the productivity. That way we get the economic multipliers that Chris Gasson was talking about yesterday. That way we can start to unleash some of this capital that we've got tied up in water we can start to get the private sector involvement that we need to ensure that, uh, that we make the most of these assets that we currently have. We've got the issues of agriculture and water and the nexus between those that also need to be managed well. We need to understand that, that there are competing needs but there are, also, there are also needs that need to be managed side by side. You cannot do agriculture policy in isolation from water policy. You can't put water over in a special box. You've got to mainstream it into things like the agriculture sector as well so that the NWI principles that have done the water sector so well are embedded in agriculture as well. So when they're making decisions about agriculture and growth in that area, the, area, the principles that have served us well um, can be carried through into those decisions. Energy and water. It's another nexus issue. It's an issue whereby you need to actually be considering both when you're making your policy decisions. A low carbon energy future is not necessarily a low water future. Many of the new energy sources that are being explored at the moment, since like coal seam gas, produce a lot of water and need a lot of water. How do we deal with the waste stream? Can we have beneficial use of that waste stream? Can we look at new products that can actually look to grow economic wealth and productivity in other areas by using those waste streams? Livability, water and planning. At the moment, the planning departments around our nation see water as the enemy. No, I shouldn't say the enemy. They see them as someone you will supply. We'll just go and ask you and you will supply. We don't need to actually build water planning into our thinking. We're building cities. But if we want livable cities, we need to build that water thinking into the planning process right up front. And it needs to be seen as not a cost, but an in integral part of ensuring that the livable cities of the future that we're building have the amenity that we need to make those cities the cities that we want them to be. And water is an integral part of that. So the last thought that we have for the way forward is backslide or build. We're at a, we're at a crossroad at the moment. We've seen significant reform and we've seen water on the agenda for a very long time. We've seen lots of money poured into the space. But at the moment it has completely slipped from the agenda. It no longer has its own stream in COAG. It's in fact not mentioned in the COAG uh, um, process or structure. Energy is, but water isn't. How do we then take the new government and the new era that we're living at the moment and build water back into that agenda. And we do it through the productivity stream. We need to be very strategic as a water sector in ensuring that the government 
as they go forward, whether or not they choose the National Water Commission as part of that future is a decision for the government. But what is critically important is that we keep the government to their promise that the NWI principles are important and need to be carried forward. So we need to assist the government as a, from an industry perspective to actually find the right places for the NWI to be embedded in the future decision making. And that means it needs to be more mainstreamed. It's not just an environmental issue. It's a critical issue and an extrinsic plank of our future um, economic wealth and, and generation of productivity. Thank you very much for your time. We have some challenges ahead. Uh, I'm working with AWA and, uh, and with uh, WASA and with key leaders across the nation to actually ensure that this government understands the importance of where we've been so that they can know why it's so critically important to continue this journey. We have not come to the end of water reform. We've come to the next stage of water reform. Thank you.